There was, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job whose name was Job and that man was perfect that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God one that feared God and eschewed evil he hated evil he hated evil and they were born unto him they were born unto him seven sons and three daughters his substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she asses and a very great household a very great household so that this man was the greatest this man was the greatest of all the men of the East this man was the greatest of all the men of the East and his sons went and feasted in their houses everyone his day everyone on his birthday and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them and it was so it was so in the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all according to the number of them all for Job said it may be it may be that my sons have sinned It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, in their hearts. Thus did Job continually, continually. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. There was a day when the sons of God, the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, Satan, came also. Satan, Satan came also among them. And the Lord, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth 
There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. He hates evil, Satan. He hates evil. Then Satan answered the Lord. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job, doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about everything that he hath? about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance has increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath. Touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee. He will curse thee to thy face, to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, behold, all that he hath, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. Put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters, there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing. The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them. The Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only, I only am escaped. I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only, I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, while he was yet speaking, There came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands. The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only, I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons, And thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness. There came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men. It fell upon the young men. And they are dead. They are dead. And I only... I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose. Then Job arose and rent his mantle. He tore his garment and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped, 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 
and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, in all this, Job sinned not. In all this, Job sinned not. Nor charged God foolishly. Again, again, there was a day when the sons of God, the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, and Satan came also among them. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord, and the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movedst me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord, and Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. Touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse thee. He will curse thee, he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord, the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, behold, he, he is in thine hand. He is in thine hand. But save his life. Save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd, a piece of broken pottery, to scrape himself with all. And he sat down, he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God, curse God! Curse God, curse God, and die, die, die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive 
go to the hand of God. And shall we not receive evil? In all this, in all this, did not Job sin with his lips? In all this, did not Job sin with his lips? Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came, every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him, to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes, when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept and wept. And they rent everyone's mantle. They tore their garments and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So, so they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights and none spake a word unto him none spake a word unto him for they saw that his grief was very great they saw that his grief was very great after this after this open job his mouth after this open job, his mouth and cursed, cursed his day, the day of his birth. And chapter 3, Job pours out his complaint to these three friends who had come to mourn with him and to comfort him. He pours out his anguish, his confusion, his torment, his grief, and all that had come upon him. And he curses, curses, curses the day he had ever been given birth or life to only have faced this, to have faced this calamity, this tragic moment when all comes against him in spite of his love for God. He curses life. He curses life in his grief. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite. Then, ans then he life as the Temanite. Then he life as the Temanite answered and said. He life as the Temanite answered and said. If we, if we essay to commune with thee. If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? Wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Behold, thou hast instructed many. Thou hast instructed many. And thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it has come upon thee, and thou faintest. It toucheth thee, and thou art troubled. Thou art troubled. Chapter 6, verse 1. But Job answered and said, but Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were throughly weighed. Oh, that my grief were throughly weighed and my calamity laid in the balances together, for now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words are swallowed up. What Job is saying here is, Oh, that all I face in my grief and my hurt and confusion was put on the one side of the balances of the scales, and on the other side, all of the words that I've uttered from my heart 
and grief and sorrow and shame. Then what I've said, what I've said in my grief to you would be just. It would be just if it's to be compared with all I've gone through. Verse 14, to him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend. To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend, but he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. He forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. And Job, Job, Job goes on to defend himself and his right standing with God and his confusion as to why this has come upon his life when he knows that he's righteous, when he knows that it's not through sin and evil that these calamities and all this has come upon him. Oh, his grief is poured out in his confusion that God would allow such things to come upon a righteous man, a man who loves God as he does. Chapter 8, verse 1, Then answered Bildad the Suhite and said, How long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Doth God pervert judgment? Or doth the Almighty pervert justice? If thy children, if thy children have sinned against him, and he have cast them away for their transgression. He have cast them away for their transgression. If thou wouldest seek unto God betimes and make thy supplication to the Almighty, if thou wert pure and upright, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. But Job, stunned at this rebuke from men who came to comfort him, to mourn with him, and now sought to accuse him, because never could God do this to a man who's righteous. Never would God be so unrighteous. Job, in his stunned confusion, listening to their reasoning, breaks down, breaks down in grief, that these comforters have no comfort at all. They only add to his torment in accusing him of evil. Chapter 11, verse 1. Then answered Zophar the Namathite and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man, should a man full of talk be justified? Should thy lies make men hold their peace? And when thou mockest, when thou mockest, should no man make thee ashamed? Shall no man make thee ashamed? For thou hast said, my doctrine is pure. And I am clean in thine eyes. Thou hast said my doctrine is pure. And I am clean in thine eyes. But oh that God would speak. And open his lips against thee. Oh that God would speak. And open his lips against thee. And he that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom. That they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee. Less than thine iniquity deserveth. Oh, what comfort is. Oh, my. You deserve more than you've got because you're so wicked. Oh. Oh. Know, therefore, that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Doesn't the devil come through the most unexpected sources, beloved? Never does he come to anyone but the most unexpected sources, beloved. Otherwise, it wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't matter. Chapter 12, verse 1. 
And Job answered and said, No doubt. No doubt, but ye are the people. Ye are the people. And wisdom should die with you. No doubt, but ye are the people. And wisdom shall die with you. But I also have understanding. As ye do. I am not inferior to you. I am not inferior to you. Chapter 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. What does that mean, beloved? I will, I will reason with God. Of all this that has come upon me unjustly, though he slay me, I'll still be trusting him. Don't doubt that. I haven't lost my trust in God. But I am deeply confused, deeply confused, and bewildered, and tormented, and shamed. And I will continue, though I'm trusting him, and though he slays me ultimately, I will continue to argue, to reason, to reason as to why he does this injustice to me. Why he would allow injustice to come upon someone who loved him and served him as I have with all my heart. But these men, these men, now their indignation, they thought righteous indignation. They come now with double vengeance, with their words, double anger, double torment for Job through those that were sent now to comfort him but to accuse him, and they accuse him vehemently of evil, of sin, of wickedness, in thinking, in suggesting that God, that God would allow all this to come upon a righteous man, is saying God is unjust. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. Miserable comforters are ye all. Shall vain words have an end? Oh, what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? I also could speak as ye do. If your soul were in my soul's stead, I could heap up words against you and shake mine head at you. But I would strengthen you with my mouth. I would strengthen you with my mouth. And the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. Chapter 32, verse 1. So these three men... So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. These three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barashel the Buzite of the kindred of Ram, against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet it condemned Job. They had found no answer and yet it condemned Job. Now this young Elihu shows us something we weren't aware of. There were others, right from the beginning. How many, I don't know. 
But this young man knew something. You see, when the elder speaks in the East, the young keep silence until the elder has no words to say. So these three men ceased to answer Job. They stopped. They had nothing left. Nothing more to accuse him of. Nothing more to try to make him see his need for seeking God in repentance of his evil that he must be full of. For God, the righteous God, to have done this to him. These three men ceased to answer Job. Then answered, then was kindled the wrath, the righteous indignation of Elihu. This young man, young Elihu, now speaks. We believe and realize he was there right from the beginning with many others, I believe. And now he stands, this young man, and he has this indignation against the wrong, the wrong of Job's three friends, in that they had found no answer, and yet had condemned him like they had. This was injustice indeed. But also, also, he accuses Job. He finds fault with Job in this thing. That he justified himself right the way through, rather than God. Rather than God. Now, this is interesting. This is of great significance because, beloved, right through to the end of the book, and we all know it, God never required Elihu to come with sacrifices for mercy and for Job to pray for his forgiveness, for God to spare him of terrible calamity because of his reasoning, of his discourse, of his reasoning and theology. God never required this. He required the other three friends to swiftly seek him for mercy, lest he deal with them after their folly for that they have said of him and done to Job. It's of great significance that God never required this of Elihu. He never required forgiveness for what he said to Job. Nor did he require anything from Job. Never did he ask Job to come with a sacrifice at the end of all this. All this reasoning. Job was not required to come with a sacrifice. That's very significant. And Elihu. So something Elihu says here is very, very true. Because he justified himself rather than God. Elihu was greatly indignated. Greatly indignated. Chapter 33, verse 12. Behold, in this thou art not just, he concludes. In this, Job, in this thou art not just. I will answer thee. I will answer thee. That God, God is greater than man. God is greater than man. Why dost thou strive against him? Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. He giveth not account of any of his matters. He giveth not account of any of his matters. Chapter 38, verse 1. Then, 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 the Lord answered Job, out of the whirlwind. Ah, hallelujah. At last God speaks. And what a shock. God gives everyone. And God always does come in the end, beloved. No matter what man says to you, sir, or your wife, or your friends, great theologians, God always comes in the end, beloved, and deals with the unjust. Don't doubt it. Then the Lord answered Job, Out! Of the whirlwind. I don't believe it was a great big thing like you have here in America. 
I believe he was sitting there in his torment and confusion and shame, worn out, drained by these men who had just added to his confusion and grief and sorrow and shame and torment now internally in his heart, wondering at their words. I believe God comes through a whirlwind and just going along the ground. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? I don't believe God came with a grievous voice. I don't believe God came with anger. I believe that God came with such love in every word to Job. It was like a healing balm. Right from the first to the last. Who is this? Who is this? That darkeneth counsel by words. Words without knowledge. Chapter 40 verse 2. Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? Do you want to teach me, Job? He that reproveth God, he that reproveth God, let him answer it. Let him answer it. Now these words, beloved, I believe Paul was deeply influenced by these words that God said to Job when he wrote the controversial Romans 9. I believe that Paul was deeply influenced by these words that God said to Job when he wrote the controversial Romans 9. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God, Paul says? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid! Hallelujah. Hope your doctrine says that. God forbid! God forbid! Verse 20, nay, but O man, who art thou? Who art thou that repliest against God, that disputest with God? Who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed him? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? And so God, with this reasoning of Elihu, Man, man cannot dispute God's righteousness and integrity and perfectness in his dealings with man. Dare not. Oh, God comes and adds to Elihu's words now, and he brings great light. Who is this, he says, that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, he that reproveth God, let him answer it. Let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. I am vile. I am vile. What shall I answer thee? What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. And so God comes to Job and reveals to him the great wonders that he as a sovereign God almighty created the universe and all its greatness beyond which the eye of man can see. There's no ending. He comes and confronts Job with he as a sovereign God of all creation, who created every living thing, who created the sea and the mountains, and the atmosphere with which we breathe and live, that he created all living things, every animal as diverse as they are in all their diversity, and yet perfection, utter perfection, that he as the creator of all living things and all the universe, the folly, the wrong, the error, 
of frail man reasoning, disputing with God as to his righteousness, his integrity, because frail man does not understand beyond the moment of what the eye can see. He accuses God. Now he reasons, he disputes God's integrity and reasons with God as to his injustice. He talks to Job and said, this is wrong. That which Elihu said is right. Job. Chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will speak. I will demand of thee. And declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But now, but now mine eye seeth thee. Now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself. I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. In dust and ashes. And it was so. It was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job. It was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job. The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee. My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept. For him will I accept. Lest I deal with you after your folly. Lest I deal with you after your folly in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Suite and Zophar the Namathite went and did according as the Lord commanded. The Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. When he prayed for his friends. When he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before. And did eat bread with him in his house. Did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him. They bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord has brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money. Every man also gave him a piece of money. And every one an earring of gold. An earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. The Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 sea asses. He had also, he had also seven sons. Hallelujah. And three daughters. Three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima, Jemima, and the name of the second, Kezia, Kezia, and the name of the third, Kiran Hapach, Kiran Hapach, 
and in all the land where no woman found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father, their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this, after this, after this lived Job an hundred and forty years. And saw his sons and his sons' sons. Even four generations. So Job died. Being old and full of days. Beloved. I'm going to take what time is left to me when everyone gets up and walked out. When the last one's here, then I know my time's up. <laughs> and I'd like to just try and share a few gleanings that I believe the Lord would have us look at in this holy book together. This book of Job was written before any other biblical manuscript had been written. It is the first of all the biblical writings, according to most of our great leaders of the faith, right from Luther down. It was written before Moses was given revelation concerning Genesis, the creation. It, of course, occurred after creation. But it was written before Moses wrote the law. Before the prophets were written. It was the first of all the writings of all manuscripts of the biblical canonized writings. Contained in this holy book under the inspiration and leading of God. In his perfectness and his perfect love to you and I who would have not one word. Not one word that isn't from God to believe this book. It is the longest book in the whole Bible of a single man. Apart from Jesus Christ, no single man in the entire scriptures has spoken of more than Job. Moses' writings were longer, Jeremiah's, Isaiah's, but no single man ever in the entire scriptures was so honored by God in the amount said about one single man apart from Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. No wonder God did it, of course. He honors them that honor him. And something about this man, brother, something about this man honored God, not only for that moment, but right through till today. Right through to today. It was written roughly 1,500 B.C. Now, they say 1,520 Schofield, although Schofield's a bit... Questionable. I still like him. He's got courage enough to tackle things that most pen wouldn't. So, even though he might not be perfect, Schofield, I think, hit the nail on the head when he said 1520 BC because of the few references in this book of the Sabians and the Chaldeans tribes attacking the flocks of Job. These fall into 1500 BC. Schofield hits the nail on the head when he says, well, one can even work it out more accurately. Because of the coin, the piece of money, the quesida. That was in the period that they found and have worked out archaeologically to be about 1520 BC. It was the same time, it is believed, as when the children of Israel, the people of God, were in the Nile Delta, the Nile Delta in Egypt, having come from, of course, Jacob coming and Joseph having been honored by God and man. And now, just before the slavery was intact, about the time of the slavery coming about, or just before this event took place, this amazing event took place, and literally took place. Don't doubt it. Well, it's a lovely, lovely thing to know, you know, that God says of a man that he was perfect. I love that. I love to say that to people who believe we have to be sin and thought, word, and deed every single moment of life and every day of our life. <laughs> One man said to me, I am what? Of all men the most wicked. Great, greatest sin of all. He was quoting Paul. I said, oh brother, I'm so sorry to hear that about you. Especially for your wife. <laughs> 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 
to know that you are the most wicked of all. Oh, brother, I hope God has done more for you than that. Be careful, brother. That's what Paul was. Read Romans chapter 6 and many other scriptures to know what Paul was in the end. He even said, be like me. <laughs> Just walk as I walk in the end. So be careful. Weigh things up, of course. And the chief of all sinners, that's the lovely word he said. <laughs> Before he was saved, that is. If he's the chief of all sinners afterwards, that means he's a murderer, an adulterer, and every other dirty thing you could think of. So be careful about doctrine, brother, just to excuse your sin. Especially if you're a preacher. What shall we say then, so we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! Let's not divert now, but isn't it wonderful? Verse 1, we've only got to verse 1. Oh, but you're still here, I think. I don't wear glasses just so that no one can scowl. So I don't know if you're smiling or scowling, so stop scowling. I don't even know if you're looking at your watches, so you can throw them away. Well, God said in 1 Peter 1 verse 15, Be ye holy in all manner of conversation, all manner of living, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. It's the cry of God to aspire to what this man has attained in God's eyes, in the light he was given. In the light that he's been given. As we walk in the light, we can, you know, Light still has to come, but the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all that more light has to reveal. Sins committed in ignorance. Don't want to go into that too easily, too. But the possibility of a man being able to live a holy life in this evil world. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and this, that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. He hated evil. Hallelujah. You can. You can, brother. You can, young man. Don't blame peer pressure if you want to be evil. Don't blame the decadence of the world and the lack of censorship. Don't blame the TV. Throw it out the door. Before you blame it. So I don't know who will be left with the TV tonight. Don't blame the internet. Brother, you don't need it to survive. If you run to things there that you know are defiling you, you can be holy. As holy as you want to be, brother. For oh, God mocks us. In the light we've been given, there's victory. Not sinless perfection. But a holy life. A consistent, wonderful, in God's eyes, that He can stand and testify of you. Even to Satan, who knows everything about you. Hallelujah that such a man lived that side of the Holy Spirit's outpouring. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit's in me and you. We have a headlong start on Job. Don't argue now. Oh, now to leave verses is going to break my heart, but I'm going to have to. I want to come to this statement. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he came before God and he continually brought sacrifices earnestly. Because of his fear, his deep, deep fear that his sons were in sin and hardened themselves against God to hate God because of their choice for sin. Now that's staggering coming from the godliest man on earth. Being godly in God's eyes, being godly, being really godly does not mean that you will not have continual concern about the spiritual state of your children, brother. You can be the holiest man on earth. But that does not mean that you will not have to have continual, deep anguish and concern about the spiritual state of your children. Actually, the further away a man is from God, the less concern he'll have of his spiritual, the spiritual walk of his children. Don't doubt that. Don't doubt that. I was with a preacher in your country a few years ago when I first preached in his church, a very, very large church in New York. And he was driving me with a very big family, all the children he had in the back of this vehicle as we were driving now from his home to the church for me to preach. And they were singing. And the harmony was so beautiful, it was like a taste of heaven. So when there was a pause, I turned and looked at all these glowing faces. 
And I said, oh, they harmonize so beautifully. They must have started as children. Isn't it lovely to have children that love God, brother? That love singing the old hymns of the faith. And he said, yes, harmony of song brings harmony of life. If they sing from the heart and we try and teach them that from childhood, somehow it's made us one as a family. Just one thing that we do of doing something of beauty together for the Lord's glory, singing. So we sing all the time as a family. I thought that was rather lovely. I was just commending his family and, for, and, his, and him for the godliness of these young children. And then suddenly there was a quietness in the car, in the vehicle, and he said words that shook me. Brother Keith, I would rather die than to see my children serving the devil. Oh God, let me die. Please God, I beg you. If my children are ever going to serve the devil, let me die now. I don't want to see it. I would rather die than to see my children eating from the devil's tables, wanting what Satan offers and not what God offered through me as a father. Let me die, God, but don't let me witness that. And he began to weep. And there was a deathly silence in that car as those children heard him weeping. Being born into a godly home does not mean you automatically will be godly, young chief children. Young boy, young man, young teenager, young 20-year-old, being born into the godliest man on earth does not mean you're going to be godly. It's your choice. It's your personal choice. Eli's sons were so wicked they killed their father. Don't doubt it. The circumstances that led to his death, they literally killed him through their wickedness. You can do that to your father, young man. Do you want to do that? Is that your choice? Young children, young people, young teenagers, young men, young girls, young ladies. Being born into a godly home does not mean that you will be godly. Can I ask every one of you young people, are you godly? Are you godly? I'm not asking you, are you religious because you're forced to be here because of who you belong to. I'm not asking if you sing in the choir or play instruments because that's the done thing. It's just expected of you. You have no choice. So you fall in. Tell me, in God's eyes and in your heart, are you godly, young boy? Are you godly, young lady? Are you godly? Not are you religious. Are you godly? Or is the godly Job's fears substantial, young person, of the child? Is your godly father and mother's fears warranted, young children? He feared. Job feared. He was so godly. No one was more godly on earth, but he feared continually calling on God, making intercession for God concerning the spiritual welfare of his children. Is the godly father's fear substantial? Is that what you want, young man? Young girl, is that your choice? Will you please, please, please don't blame your father. That's your choice. But you're going to break his heart. As nothing else on earth will break his heart, you're going to break his heart. And probably kill him, not with a knife, but with a life. The choice you made. But then that's your choice. You love him so little. And if you love him so little, how little do you love God that you rejected for Satan? What a terrible choice, young people. Be careful. Are you real? Not are you religious? 
most religious in the Bible, Jesus Christ condemned with utter condemnation. Are you real? And then a staggering thing happens. The angels come and present themselves before the Lord. Satan comes. And God says to Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan says staggering words. From going to and fro in the earth. Don't doubt it. He won't miss you if you want him. You want him to destroy your soul and your life. Trust me. Sin is for the moment and you can laugh and have happiness. But I guarantee you. Sin doesn't go beyond the moment, and eventually it crumbles everything until you have no honor. And when you lose your honor, you've got nothing. Once you lose your honor, you have nothing. 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 Don't lose it. But this evil being, this enemy of God and those who would seek God... He says to God from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. I believe Peter was deeply moved as he read these words in Job when he wrote 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. You think he won't devour you, young man? I have seen men, young men, sit in meetings with shining little faces, singing hymns. And the next thing I've seen them, they're in deep, deep depravity. And the next moment I've seen them, they're dead, young, teenagers, wiped out, cut in half. As they drove off, as I pled with them for Christ, minutes later, cut in half. I've seen one after the other wiped out minutes when they thought they could go away from God, but they didn't know that was God's final plea. Don't play the fool with eternity. Don't play the fool with this evil being. Seeking whom he may devour, he will. He has no compassion. He's the exact opposite to God. God has compassion. He's long-suffering. Satan has nothing. Nothing but hatred for the soul. Nothing. Nothing. He'll come with a vengeance against you when you give him a moment. Just a little words to devour you. Don't do it. Don't do it. You don't have to. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. God will make sure about that. He puts himself in a holy obligation through these promises. You obey the promises. And every promise has a condition. God will make Satan flee. But do you want to resist all the devil is trying to do? That's your choice. So Satan, now, don't you believe he didn't know about Job? <laughs> don't believe Job just happened to come along the conversation. He was there because of Job. Don't doubt it. Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. Perfect, upright, one that feareth God, yes, he hates evil. Doth Job fear God for naught? Oh, he had words waiting. He had venom in his heart. He had anger like you and I have never known anger. He had fear. He had torment. Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about everything that he hath on every, about all that he hath on every side? I can't get near him. You so protect him. You won't let me touch him. Thus bless the work of his hands, his substance. You blessed him. But, but, put forth thine hand now and touch, take away literally all that he hath. It's no wonder he loves you. It's no wonder he serves you. Look at him, the wealthiest man on earth. Look at him. I can't get near him to touch him or hurt him to test his faith. Touch all that he hath. Take away everything you've given him and I'll show thee he, not just me, this is what was behind Satan, he also, he will curse thee if you don't bless him like this with goodness and material wealth and everything he's got and the esteem of man. He will curse thee to thy face also. And God suddenly staggers you and me and generation upon generation when he says something that really, really is beyond comprehension. All that he has, every single thing he has, all that he hath, 
is in thine hands, God. But save his life. Only upon himself put not for thine hand. Now, suddenly, Job has made the battlefield, the war zone between God and Satan. And this is the staggering thing. God doesn't come to Job and explain to him. If only he had, Job would have said, let him come. I don't care what happens now. I know what it's all about. But Job didn't know it was the devil. He reasons against God's unrighteousness doing this to him. He, he doesn't see any. He doesn't know anything. He didn't have any books to refer to. There was no Bible. He lived in a time that was just passed on from generation to generation. Even his being the priest in the home. Every father had to be the priest in the home. Before the Mosaic laws concerning the priesthood was coming. But here was this man with nothing. He didn't know anything to consult in, anything to sort of read and say, oh, let's read about Wittenbrunt and watch my knee and everybody will get, take courage, you know. Nothing. No reasoning, no theological documents to refer to concerning sufferings. Here he comes. It's about to be written for the first book about sufferings in eternity. True Christian book. Well, so... Suddenly, Satan is given an allowance to come with a spiral vengeance. You know, he comes, the broadness wipes out everything broadly. And it becomes less and less, more and more central as he wipes out. And Job's hearing him wiped out, broad and right down, right down, right down to the things most treasured in life. All his children, gone. Oh, now that's something in one day to happen. In one continued conversation, by the way, it didn't stop just coming. Do you think Satan didn't have the timing correct? Let's hit him, and let's hit him, and as he's weakening, let's hit him with his children! You think that can't happen, brother? I've stood with multi-millionaires, literally multi-millionaires, not one, who lost everything in one day. You think that can't happen to you, brother? Do you think America's void of such things happening? In my country, which had great wealth, and sanctions suddenly came and problems came and the economy collapsed. Multi-millionaires lost farmlands of four generations of great plantations. I saw a man walk out with a suitcase. He was marched by the security of the bank when he was declared bankrupt onto the street. He wasn't allowed to take his car. He wasn't allowed to take his furniture. He wasn't allowed to take the paintings on his wall. And on the street he had a suitcase with his family, his wife and children, weeping, looking back at what was no longer his. And they said, nothing else is yours. You can't have another thing. You've lost everything in life. All he had was a suitcase. The day before, brother, he was a multimillionaire. You think that can't happen? I watched men like that on many occasions, including my own father-in-law, when I saw everything, everything they had in life wiped out in one day, and I looked at them, tears coming down my eyes, but what shook me, you think Job was the only one? I saw them raise their hands with tears coming down their faces. And their hearts trembling as they looked at their loss. And I heard them say, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Tears. 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 And I finished off the verse to them. I've seen men. I've been in men's homes when news came through that door that all their children were dead. Every child was gone, dead, wiped away. In all the atrocities that have happened in Southern Africa, on their way home from university, gonna surprise daddy and mommy, wiped out by machine guns because they got in the wrong taxi. And other taxi drivers who felt threatened just wipe out those who even get in the wrong taxi. You can't believe what they kill for. In Africa. And I've seen a godly father and a godly mother as I've just trembled and stood and weeping in shock and horror. Fall down, even just pulling his wife down and weeping and groaning and saying, The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I finished the verse God was writing in heaven, and all this they sinned not. Tell me, brother, when God touches anything, sister, is that written in heaven? Is that written by those watching? 
in all this Job sin not nor charge God foolishly? And shall all his news comes to Job, everything wiped away, every material possession, all his greatness, his children, gone. What does he do? He stands up, he shaves his head, tears his garments, falls down on the ground, and what? Believe me, Satan and all the demonic hosts, one third of all the stars, all the angels of heaven were swept by his tail, his influence when he rebelled against God. They're now desperate demons and they're millions across earth. They were waiting. Don't believe anyone wasn't. He'll do what Satan said now. What's he going to do? He falls down on the ground and, and, and. And can you imagine Satan and demons hurled back a billion miles, screaming in fear and shame and shock and humiliation? He worships. Amen. Hallelujah for such a man. Hallelujah that God gave us such a book, the textbook in the school of God, in case you don't think you're in God's school, brother, the day you're saved, you're in God's school. And you've got to pass exams. And the time is little. Fail the exam, brother, you will write it again. Just like secular school. You better pass, sister. You'll face it again and again and again. There's no such a thing as bypassing the standard in the school of God. Be careful. He worships. He worships. In everything give thanks. God says, this is the will of God concerning Christ in you. This is the will of God concerning... Isn't it amazing that God says this? Though the fig tree blossom not, when everything fails, all the herds, everything, I've lost everything, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. That's the school book. That's not there to read and say, isn't that lovely to put against the wall? That's to do. This is the test. This is the textbook. I hope you do what it teaches you when you face the exams. Do you think they're just there for little verses to, 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 to quote? No, 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 no. You think you won't face anything, brother, sister? Wait. Be careful. Be careful. Heaven's coming. In this world, you shall have tribulation. That's a promise. Not only the good promises. Give thanks. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. When you offer the sacrifice of praise, when everything goes wrong, it's a sacrifice. It's easy to praise God when you're a multimillionaire. Let God take everything away. When your children are blossoming, oh, praise the Lord. But let them... Tell me, brother, when it's a sacrifice, when it's really difficult, when oh, everything, to offer the sacrifice, and it's grieving. You know what true praise is of any worth, beloved? Is when the tears are flowing down your face, when your heart is trembling, when you're so confused, you're so confused, and your whole being is just collapsing, sinking. But then, instead of accusing God, arguing, hating Him, cursing Him, to offer thanks, giving the fruit of our lips in every circumstance of thanks to God. That glorifies God. An old godly woman in our country said to her fiery husband that wanted to praise the Lord for everything, including what the devil said, she said, No! We do need wives, you know. She said, No, you're wrong. You don't praise God for everything. You don't praise God if your children go into sin. You don't praise God for that. You don't praise God if your children get disease and die. You don't praise God for that. You don't praise God for sin when sin comes in a person's life. And you don't praise God for everything the devil does. You praise God in spite of anything that happens. There's a great difference. You praise God. You offer the sacrifice of praise in spite of anything. There's a great difference. But do you do it? The value when everything goes wrong and you praise is a billion zillion times more in God's eyes and man's if you pass the exam of praise in everything, not for everything, in spite of everything. But be careful now, the staggering thing. Does that mean the humiliation of Satan has been proved wrong, that that's it? No, again, Satan doesn't give up. You know, when the Lord was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, there's a little verse there that says, Satan left him for a season. Do you think he's going to not leave you just for a season? He's going to come back with a vengeance. This book isn't here for our interest. This book is to tell us what we're dealing with. 
Nothing is just for interest. It's there to give you the heart of God, the mind of Christ, and in the light of all other scriptures in their context, to know what to do, what God is waiting for. Satan comes back with such a vengeance, his humiliation now, his defeat, his horror, and all the demons of hell fleeing back, still probably way back beyond the... Now he comes back and he says to the Lord, as he admits with no words, but he admits total defeat by not saying anything. But he does say this. A man will give everything away for his life. Now, brother, you've got good health, haven't you? Sister, oh, it's been good. But he comes and he says, touch his bone and his flesh. Make him sick. Make him sick suffer and he will curse thee to thy face he will he will don't doubt us now satan really believed this would happen so god says behold he is in thine hand but save his life within moments this man is inflicted with such disease such torment such suffering such pain that you and i have never ever seen the likes the excruciating suffering of this man was beyond comprehension he sits down in the dust not in the house which is still standing. He can't even go, he just sits down in the dust and starts scraping himself, weeping and groaning and weeping and crying before God and man. And then, isn't it terrifying? You know, I believe that the worst, the worst trials that can come upon a man are physical. Satan hasn't given up. So now, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, Satan tried right into his death on the cross. He didn't give up. He carried on and for a season he left him, but he came back, bow, with one, even through Peter. He comes. He comes into a crisis on the cross trying. Don't think he's going to give up. Right on the cross as Christ is about to die. For all mankind, he's doing everything. Do you think those men were just saying, let him come down and save himself now? He said he could save us. Let him. Do you think that wasn't Satan trying? Till the end, Satan tries. He tests. There's no such a thing as him sitting down, even when you're dying, brother, and leaving you, and saying, now I can't test. Oh. Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. That's a staggering verse. I don't believe Christ could have been disobedient, personally. I don't know how you could believe that. But I believe that verse means he fulfilled God's purpose for his life, the blueprint in sending him as God the Son by suffering the death of the cross, by facing it. Oh, it wasn't easy for him to face it. Blood, literal blood, not sweat. Blood like sweat poured from his forehead. Can you believe the torment as he tries? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. I didn't, it was a terrifying thing he was facing. To face physical sufferings and torment beyond our comprehension for him, but even for us. Oh God, let this pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He looked for grace that you and I have to look for also. In whatever God's purposes are in allowing things in our life. Now, beloved, I believe it is perhaps the worst, I would say the worst form of trial you'll ever face in your life. I was with a man in a hospital recently in my country, in our capital, and they called me. This young boy came up to me after some meeting, and he said, Sir, this man is dying, and he's in such torment, and he's begging me. He said, I must come you, I must beg you to come to him. I beg you, come to him. He's seen videos of yours or something. Come to him, he's dying, he's heard you in Pretoria preaching. Come! I beg you, and tears were in his eyes. I said, all right, boy, take me. And I went to this hospital and I saw this man. The suffering this man was going through was beyond comprehension. All the things on his body and his face. And his body was literally quaking from pain. Oh, you can't believe. I looked at him and I just started weeping. I, the tears had poured. I couldn't believe this man was in such torment. And he tried to speak as he saw me. Tears coming down and a little smile. And I thought, what am I doing here? This man tried to speak. Every word brought suffering like you and I have never seen. I've never seen. Each word, he's, oh, he just tries to get a word. It took quite a while. He got out this, just this. Brother, 
I'm not scared of dying. I'm scared of living any longer in case I curse God. I want to die. I don't want to live. I'm not scared of death. I'm scared of life because I'm going to curse God. If he doesn't take me, please, please. And he, he started sobbing. He thought, oh, the sobs brought pain. Ask God to take me before I curse. I don't want to curse. I don't want to curse. I put my hands and prayed, oh God, take him. And he died. He was released. God will never suffer you to be tempted above that you're able to bear to be tested. Don't doubt it. We might not be able to reason. But doubt. Don't doubt God's perfectness, even how you die and when you die. He won't ever, 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 ever let you suffer. In what he does not, in his perfectness, one day will explain to you that you'll worship him for his perfect timing even, in his will. Be careful. Many people believe that sickness is the result of sin. That's staggering, you know. I think that's the heart of carnality in the ministry. This man was the godliest man on earth. Now, how do you get over that in your theology, sir? I've heard men say, if you're not healed when we pray for you, it's because of sin in your life or unbelief. And that's a bit carnal. Why isn't it because of their sin? I mean, they prayed. <laughs> I mean, it's the, heart, the height of carnality. How can you stoop to such a low degree, brother? It's you that prayed. It's your prayer that wasn't answered. You can't stand in the shadow of the godly who suffer. God probably can't allow it to come on you, sir, because you'd give in. He'll never let anything come on a man that will just break him. Be careful how you judge. The godliest of the godliest of the godliest that ever lived have suffered excruciating suffering and died not in old age but in sickness. And don't tell me it was their sin, brother, or unbelief. You might say when they brought people to Jesus that everyone was healed. Everyone. Well, you're right. But, brother, there's the rest of the scriptures. Has it ever occurred to you that your interpretation of any verse in this book is not correct unless looked at in the light of the rest of the scriptures? If your interpretation is contradicted by any other verse in this whole Bible concerning that doctrine or verse, you're heretical. You can only stand in the light of the rest of the scriptures. If anything contradicts your interpretation of any view or doctrine, your view is not right. That's why the Jehovah Witnesses like to take half text. You know, you dare not read the next text. <laughs> Don't be like them. You dare not let people... The rest of the scriptures teach us that many godly do die and do suffer. Where do you see that? You say, oh, right through the Bible, brother. You just need to read the whole Bible and not just get brainwashed with your pet theology your church is going to teach you. In their fanaticism. Brother, if you're in the doctrine business, get out of the pulpit. If you're not there for compassion, if your harshest word doesn't throb with love from the pulpit, leave the pulpit because God will deal with you. If your harshest word doesn't throb, I've seen people die of terrible torment because Christian people said, if you take any medication, it's a sign of unbelief and sin. Now that I've prayed for you. So I've seen people die, their whole bodies quaking, their children, their husband, hating God because of what Christians made their mother die that could have taken medication. That God has given wisdom to man to relieve the pain. Oh, don't be cruel, brother, with your doctrine. Jacob, he limped and halted. You know, God's, God crippled him, not the devil. Isn't that terrible for you people who say all oh, sicknesses of the devil? Ooh, ooh, ooh. God literally crippled this man to make him give in the fight. God so longed to make him holy. And God healed him spiritually. Don't doubt that. He was probably the holiest man on earth at that time. The moment from Peniel where he gave in the fight and clung to God. And God made him a prince, not of a secular or human role, but as a spiritual realm. 
God did something holy in this man. But God never saw fit to heal him physically. He healed him spiritually, don't doubt that. But he never saw fit to heal him physically. In his wisdom, to bring out the best of that. Oh, God has a perfectness and understanding. Do you know, this man, Jacob, was so crippled by God, by God, by the way, that he limped and he halted. you know what that means? He took a step and he dragged his foot. He had to drag it. Then he took another step and dragged his foot. That's what it means. You could see Jacob a mile away. That's him. God, in his perfect understanding of Jacob, allowed this to continue. He never healed him physically. Elisha. New Testament miracles. You want to talk about the New Testament, brother? The dead were raised, the sick lepers. One thing, he died. Not in old age, he died in his sickness. I'm so glad God put that there. He's very careful, by the way. Every word God puts is for you to get balanced and full of love and compassion and not to be radical in your doctrines that hurt men. At his grave, Elijah's grave, people came to look to the God of Elisha and God did miracles right there at his tomb. He didn't die in unbelief. He didn't die in sin. If he had, believe me, God doesn't leave out anything. He tells of Jacob's sin in his detail. He tells of David's sin. That brings, still brings shame, but God tells. He tells of Moses' failure. He tells. He, doesn't, he would have told of Elisha. Elisha didn't die backslidden. He died the way God wanted him to die. A young man, 54 years old, they reckon. Most of the scholars would reckon that age. He died the way God wanted him to die. In his sickness, though he was used by God and his faith for God, others were healed. Oh, New Testament, you say? Yeah, well, the New Testament brother is full of it also. Epaphroditus. I send him back to the church at Philippi, off the mission field. I don't send him back to be shamed because he's full of sin now that he's sick. I send him back to, to spare myself any further sorrow because of the sickness. And you, you at Philippi who sent him, to work alongside of me for the gospel as a missionary. I send, I'm sending him off the field. But honor him. Honor such. Because for the work of Christ, he's in the state. I don't send him back backslidden. Have you ever seen that in the Bible, you people that preach such things? Trophimus. Have I left at Militum sick? Paul says. I haven't lost my faith. I who prayed and people were raised from the dead. I haven't lost my faith. Trophimus, by the way, he wasn't like Demas, having loved this present world, who's forsaken me. He would have said so. Trophimus, if you see in all the, uh, the salutations, you'll find he's right there, right through. Godly, revered, never a word against him. But I left him sick. This godly man, I was with him, but I left him sick. He couldn't come on me. It wasn't my unbelief. It wasn't his sin. I would have said so. It just happens to be the will of God right then, if you really want to be honest. Timothy, take a little wine for medical reasons. For thine oft infirmities, the weaknesses of your stomach, for thy stomach's sake. He had a problem. Oh, it was often, it was there again and again. It was something really hurting Timothy. Timothy, use it for medical reasons. He speaks with compassion. He doesn't say, Timothy, you're backslidden. <laughs> Why can't you pray for the sickness in your stomach, all this hurt? No, no, no. I have no man like him in the faith. He never changed his mind when he got sick, by the way. And you people, and what about Paul himself? Which many scholars, I don't want to go on that because we're not 100% sure of what his infirmity was. But we're almost sure he was physically set back badly also that God didn't heal. Oh, be careful. Be careful. Now, beloved, suddenly, do you think Satan gives up when Job doesn't fail again and again and again? He doesn't ever give up. Who does he come through next? His wife. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Do you still profess to be righteous when all this has come against you? Curse God and die. She says, Oh, imagine that. Isn't it amazing? The devil uses the people you least expect it from. She was given to him for a help meet. It's not good for a man to be alone. It's not good. When he, it's good when there's two, one falls, the other, oh, she, he needs him. It's a good thing for a man to get a woman. 
Now, for a spiritual level, this woman should have helped. What does she do? She does exactly what the devil wants her to do. She says, word perfect, what the devil wants him to do. You think it wasn't the devil coming now next to people that love you? In their confusion, have mercy on her. She also lost all her children and everything and sees her husband suffering like this. Have mercy. But the fact is, brace yourselves. Peter turned to Jesus in love and Jesus saw Satan in it. Get behind me, Satan! He knew exactly what was behind that love, that compassion, keeping him from the will of God. Do you think the love of this woman wasn't something the devil could use? If she had just taken her eyes off Jesus, you just got to take your eyes off Jesus, brother, sister. You can be saying things the devil wants you to word perfect to another person. You think Satan gives up? Oh, what does he say? Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? Shall we not receive evil? Shall we not receive evil? Do we only serve God and love Him if everything goes right, woman? What sort of a religion is that? What depth is there? Do we cease to love God if things go wrong? The moment everything isn't perfect and right, do we cease to love Him and trust Him? That's foolish, woman. And then, hallelujah, in all this, did not Job sin with his lips? Passed. First exam, examinations, results sent back. Examiner's remarks, 100%. <laughs> Don't doubt it. This was an examination passed when the Lord said, In all this, Job sin not, nor charge God foolishly. In all this, did not Job sin with his lips. Hallelujah. Trust me, this was God's comment, the examiner's comment. Perfect. Just what I expected, Job. I expected, oh, I'd never have let this come upon you if I didn't expect you capable of achieving such a thing. One thousand percent. Hmm. If you don't think that's the examination, by the way, I'm the only one in the college where I am lecturing in Africa that gives more than a hundred percent. They haven't fired me yet. <laughs> And uh, they did have asked me once, how can you give people more than 100%? I said, because they deserve it. <laughs> Sometimes 100% is not good enough. Well, let me tell you, when God said these words, God was saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Trust me, beloved, if you're going to hear God say that one day in heaven, he has to be able to say it about you now, today, tomorrow, or you'll never hear it. You'll get there by grace, and his grace is amazing. But to, to miss his well done, I don't want to miss that. You think the devil gives up now? No. Boom. What does he see on the horizon coming? Job's three friends. What are they coming for? To comfort him, to mourn with him. Do you think the devil wasn't watching now? How can I use them? Here's the next things I can use. I've used his wife. It didn't work. But now come his friends. Sure, they start weeping, they mourn, they stunned. And they listen to him cursing the day of his birth and all his grief. And so they start. And by the way, if you don't think it was the devil using them, you're in for trouble. Can devil use theology? I mean, I'll be honest with you, it was good theology. You think of some of the things there. Know this, that, that God exacted thee less than thine iniquity deserve. It's the rest of the scriptures. He hath not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our sins. God doesn't, his mercy there, it's... it's it's good doctrine. I mean, they would have been professors of theology. Don't doubt it. Good doctrine. Correct doctrine. Right doctrine. Wrong address. And then you're in trouble with God, preacher. <laughs> you think I'm saying light words? Brother, there's times you don't say what you know if you love God. Does that make sense? You think you're here to defend the faith. You're not. You're here for the soul. You who are here just for the faith, just for the doctrine, but have no compassion in the soul, so you'll just say it, even if you lose them, even if they walk out crawling, even if their lives crumble, even if their marriages crumble on some of your doctrines. Be careful. Be careful. There's a God behind this word in the light of all scriptures. There's a God here that's looking, and these people were saying wonderful doctrine, if you really think about it, but wrong address. And they were in trouble with God. I pity the man who's in this pulpit, who's there for doctrine, but not for the compassion of souls, that every single throbbing word that he ever dares to say is not out of deep compassion for the soul's welfare, no matter who that soul may be. You're in trouble with God. 
And so they give him all this whacking, whacking, oh. And so we come right to the end. And we get the Lord coming to this goodly man. And this goodly man being explained by the dear Lord of all that's come upon him. And the wonder of it is what Job says to God and how Job, now I'm going to end with these words. And I want you to listen very carefully. When everything comes against you, and don't doubt it, sir, it will. I don't say to the degree that it came against Job. Don't doubt that. But you're not in heaven yet, brother. In heaven there's no trouble, sister. On earth, it's a small little time God's got. What is it all about? Listen carefully. When all comes against you, when everything, and it's beyond reason, beyond comprehension that God could allow it because you know you love Him. And you know in your weakness, in spite of it, you strive to serve Him with every faculty of your being. You know that. You know the devil accuses, doesn't he, when you get sick. Oh, when you go wrong financially. Oh, when things go wrong, when tragedy comes, when suffering, when people accuse you. When your children go astray. How many preachers don't I know about that here in your land? One preacher back there where I preached when I first came to America, his son's in prison. His daughter I didn't want to touch with, so he left the pulpit. Broken, gray, aged, they say. His wife's sick, just gone, broken. You think you're not going to destroy them, young people? You want that? <laughs> Do you want that, boy? For God's sake, wake up and answer before it's too late. There's a turning point that you can never change. But you've done the damage. He said something about and his congregation didn't want him to go. But his own heart says, as he looks at this, I, I, I can't preach if my children are like this. I don't, I don't believe congregations anywhere should make a man do that. If a child is going through a rebellious stage, because I tell you what, if that is so, then most preachers would have to get out of the pulpit. Don't you come down on men. When a boy or a girl is going through a rebellious stage, that's their personal moment where they've got to sort it out. It's no longer the age where you just say, yes, daddy, yes, mommy, and you do it, I love them. It's a personal moment. You've got to make up your mind. It's your choice. And don't make a man leave this pulpit if that moment, if it comes on, every, on most people. Many are protected by the homeschooling, hallelujah, but in the hearts even. Trust me, your children have to come to their own personal choice when no one's watching and God knows what that choice is when it's only between them and God. And you'll be surprised what their choice will be when no one but God's watching. I don't believe that congregations should push a man out or, or compel him. Up. I'm fearful that a man also looks at these scriptures and gets into total disarray and inability to function anymore by faith because he sees things that his heart says no. But I've seen this happening again and again with godly men. But just don't you be the one to push them out because believe me, very few preachers, especially preachers, some old man came to me in America years ago and said, listen boy, you are on the front line of the battle and I see what you're doing. I see what's in your heart for God. But be careful. If the devil can't get you, he'll aim at your children a billion times more than he'll aim at any other Christian's children if you're in the pulpit like this making such a stand for God. You better pray for your children. The devil's going to hammer them if you're in the pulpit and you're being used by God and you want God's best with no compromise. I so trembled that I went into war that night. And I stayed in war till this day. There's seldom a day I don't go down the streets of every town, including Oklahoma City yesterday, crying out in war for my children to be protected under the blood of Christ, for God to rebuke the devil. Oh, we need to pray like Job. But be careful, don't condemn. Because I had a little lady come to me one day and said to me, be, be careful, boy. I was young. We condemned, we condemned our preacher. 
we said he was wrong the way he raised his children. That was his fault. And two weeks later, my children went. My daughter's a prostitute now in Europe. My son's in prison. Oh, kids, be careful. Don't judge a man. Leave the judging to God. All you do is pray and try and encourage a man. Don't you dare judge. Be careful, you people. When you reach this terrible moment when all hell comes against you, when you reach this point, be careful, you reach the privileged spot on the spiritual map toward heaven to pass a great milestone and move on to greater heights than most ever will reach if God's trusted you for such a thing to happen to you. But don't fail now. Don't begin to cry out, ye have deceived me. Like Jeremiah, I was deceived. Will thou be altogether unto me as a liar? He called God liar. And as waters that fail, everything thou hast promised has failed. Don't do that when things go wrong, Jeremiah. Cry out loud now, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. When you reach that mark and you can cry that from your heart, no matter what's coming, brother, you're in the university of God. That seldom men will reach such heights in the school of God if you can cry that from your soul. For God's voice, for God's ears, and making sure the devil hears it too. Abraham staggered not. Didn't matter how long it took, the promises were there, nothing was happening. No ages here, everything's gone. He staggered not in unbelief. Don't stagger now, child. Run above all that Satan tells you of God's betrayal, of God's cruelty, of God's denial of your rights, even of his promises. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. That's the job of today. Doesn't matter how long it takes and what I've got to go through. Doesn't matter. God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. 2 Chronicles 32 verse 31. God left him to try him. Do you think he isn't going to do that to you and me? To know that he might know all that was in his heart. Psalm 105, verse 19, conserving Joseph until the time of his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. What does that mean? Until the time of his word came, the word of the Lord tried. Poor old Joseph, there he was, promises in prison. Stocks around, steel things around his, and chains around his leg. There he is in the cold. Think that was easy? Until the fulfillment of God's promise came, the unfulfilled promise became the test of his faith above everything else. This tests us to see if you take your eyes and say it isn't so, God's denying me. Or if you keep trusting him, if you keep trusting him, beloved. That's the great thing, to keep trusting God. Your darkest moment you will ever face in life, beloved. Never forget this. Your darkest moment you will ever face in life is when God is about to do His greatest work in and through you. Don't ever doubt that. All things work together for the good to them that love God. Otherwise, God's lying. Even the darkest moment you will ever face in life, brother, sister. Otherwise, God has lost control and He can't. He's God. He's sovereign. Keep your eyes on Jesus now. Don't look at the circumstances like Peter who was doing the miraculous, what no man could do. But when he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the circumstances the devil was creating, he sunk. You will sink. You will sink. If you take your eyes off Jesus, how do you keep your eyes on Jesus? By keeping this book open and only opening it for one reason, even if you're a preacher, not for a message, but for God's voice. This is God's word. This is God's way of speaking. Open it, devour it, meditate it, make it your greatest thing to listen to God speaking and in His sovereignty you have words coming, rhema coming all the time to heal you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to heal the wounds. Otherwise you come out of this, you don't keep your eyes on Jesus. This is how you keep your eyes on Jesus. He's not physical to look at. Here is where we keep our eyes on Christ and our hearts open to Him, to hear His voice and to keep faith, to keep fixed on Him. Don't dare think you'll survive without this, but... If you don't, if you take your eyes off Christ and you begin to sink, you'll become bitter and angry against God and man rather than to come out more like Christ. Your darkest moment 
that you will ever face is when God is about to do his greatest work in and through you. Don't ever doubt that. When Bunyan was thrown into prison, what do you think the devil said? There! Ha! I'll keep him quiet now! Amazing how things backfire on the devil, you know. <laughs> I mean, look at this one, man. He walked up to me in Ohio and said to me, you know, if the devil knew what was going to happen, how many millions, millions, right down to now, when you preach this tonight, he said, if the devil knew how much courage would be taken by millions and millions, would get up and go on with faith through this, the devil would never have touched Job. <laughs> oh, it backfired. He's woaning today. You think he's ever got over it? Right now he's grieved. He's weeping. He's howling in shame. Don't doubt it. I say it under the blood. But, Bunyan, what happens? Cold prison. Oh, the end of me. Woe is me. I try to serve God. Look what happens to me. Oh, no, no, no. Right there, your darkest moment, every single one of us, will be God's greatest work ever accomplished in your life if you don't take your eyes off Jesus. The man was in touch with God. He was communing with God. And suddenly, revelation comes. Wow. And he writes a book that becomes the second most printed and second most read book on earth's history. The Pilgrim's Progress. Hallelujah. Apart from this book, no other single book has ever been printed so much or read so much by so many millions and hundreds of millions of people as the Pilgrim's Progress. So there was his darkest hour. He did his greatest work for God. And it backfires on the devil. Do you think God, do you think God just had a, to point a proof Prove a point with the devil about Job not failing? That's not true. You've got to look at even Job in the light of all scriptures. And the God of the New Testament was the God of then. God knew the principle of the fires, the refining fires. And God knew that this man would come out more holy than ever before. And if he was the godliest man on earth then, can you imagine how godly he was afterwards? The principle of the trial of your faith, being more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. It worketh the peaceable fruit of holiness. Beloved, out of the fires come Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness such as you've never believed God could work in a man. I was sitting with a man in our country a few years ago. He knew this book like very few. He was such a strong character, he was fearful. He simply wiped the floor of anybody that dared to open their mouth doctrinally. He just took you and swung you around in circles. He had such a knowledge of this book. I sat there just fearful, looking at the man, thinking, where does he come from? But what a strong character. Strong Paul, you didn't play the fool with such a man. No, he knew the scriptures. He wiped the floor of you with his confidence and his abilities. Two years later, I sat in a town hundreds of miles away after I had preached one night. I was taking this very wealthy home. And out of the door walks a little man, helped along, hobbling, bent, gray. And he looks at me, brother kids. And he sits, he's there for a while, doesn't say a word, doesn't want to dominate the conversation, doesn't want to wipe the floor. He walks out eventually, this broken, gentle man that had nothing of ability, didn't even want to speak. He felt no threat in not speaking, not dominating. He walks out, I said, who is that man? What's his name? They told me, and I stood up in shock. In two years... There's nothing left of him. God knows how to take us through crash courses, beloved. To bring out Christ like us. You think confidence, God isn't going to get rid of you? Young men, who, oh, you got, I'll tell you something in the school of God. God's going to bring, if he can, just let him. You to a place where you won't be able to take another step in life. Unless you're conscious that, apart from grace, I'm not even going to stand again, God. Only grace will help me to take another step after all. Do you think God doesn't want that? Do you think God looks at your confidence and all your abilities, all you, and doesn't want to wipe it out? In the end, brother, sister, in his crash course, you have to be ready to step into heaven. And while on earth, you have to be made as Christ-like as humanly possible. God's not interested in your great abilities. God's not interested in your great character, your strength of character, your abilities even with this. God's interested in Christ. I don't care what you achieve. Until Jesus is seen in your reactions, you're nothing. According to 1 Corinthians 13, because that word love, charity, is Christ. Just put that on. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. Christ. 
making you conforming you to the image of Christ in your every reaction. Believe me, fires do that, not just coming out and kneeling and saying, God, I absolutely surrender. That's good. But the fires, brother, the fires are what God has to take us all through to make us like Jesus, to wipe out all the dross, all the rubbish. The fires do that, brother. Till they saw Christ stood with the man who led our missionary society for years. He was big. He was strong. And in a few years, one day he walked, couldn't be the leader anymore, so frail through sicknesses and sufferings and shocks and tragedies that came upon him on every level. You name it, it came on him. This man came to say goodbye to me. He traveled a long way with his little wife and walked through this door. And he said, I've come all this way, Keith boy, just to say goodbye to you as you go to another country. I want to say goodbye to you, boy. And I looked at him and you know, I couldn't believe what was left of him. There was nothing that would make men jump and run in fear of him. There was nothing of a strong character, of great leadership qualities. There was only Jesus, gentleness, tenderness, nothing, nothing of self-lift. Have you ever seen God do that to a man in a matter of a few years? In the crash courses God must put us through to bring out the one thing that matters. Not a great preacher. Christ, brother. Christ. Trust him. Your darkest moment is going to be the greatest work you're ever going to see God accomplishing in your life if you just trust Him. That moment, as that man said goodbye, I looked at him and I said to God, God, this man is so Christ-like through the fires. There's nothing left of him, nothing left of self. He's ready to take the next step into heaven. He can just take a step. He's so prepared by God the Holy Spirit. He can walk into heaven. He's, I thought of that. I got on the plane three hours later and while I was on that plane, he died. And went into heaven. But prepared. You think God's lost control when everything seems to lose control? Brother, God's in perfect control. Your time's just running out. Some of you children, your time's running out. You're not going to reach 25. Do you know most people that die in one week are under the age of 21? Do you know that? Do you honestly think life is for old people to reach? You think things are against you, young people. Let me tell you, every single one of you sitting here, Nothing comes against you. Nothing will ever come near you that isn't for your good. And God, in seeing what you will allow him to do because of your faith and your determination not to take your eyes off him, though he slay you, wants one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing to be seen before you die. Jesus Christ. Christ-likeness. Take that out of your life, brother. You've got nothing. According to 1 Corinthians, just grief to God and man, no matter how great you are through physical and own abilities.